You know, God wants us to put our trust in Him, doesn't He? We've been talking about that every week for, since the beginning of this year. Today, we're going to talk about world changes. World changes. You know, for a Christian, life is all about learning how to trust God and how to give Him control even when things are tough, even when things change, right? No matter what's going on, no matter what, the, what news you might receive, whether it's good or bad, you can trust God. So that's why our focus for this year is don't let the news persuade you. Just trust God. And here's the scripture God gave us to focus on this whole year. Psalm 112.7 says, They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. And that's what we are focused on here. You know, Christians have no reason to fear anything in this world. We can confidently trust God to take care of us in any and every situation. You agree? Okay. As long as you are living the way God told you to, you have nothing to fear in this world or the next. Because God's going to take care of you for eternity. You can trust Him. We have been studying Psalm 46 to learn who God is and why we can trust Him. Let me read the first few verses of Psalm 46, verses 1 through 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. Hmm. And though the mountains shake into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains quake at its lofty pride. You know, we've already learned from these verses how we can trust God because He is a refuge we can hide in. And how He is ready to help us anytime we need. And, and, and He's still trustworthy, we found, when the earth gives way under our feet. Or when waters run wild. Remember us talking about floods a few weeks ago. We talked about our part in faith and how we are to be sure that we are still in the faith. We have to test ourselves, the Bible says, to make sure we're still in the faith. Last week we saw how God uses earthquakes for our own good. If you've missed any of these, I recommend go to our uh, app or to our YouTube channel and listen, because these promote our trust in God. They explain why and how you can trust Him. You don't want to miss any of these. Today, I want to talk about how changes to our world are necessary. They're a necessary part of life for a Christian. You see up here, Psalm 46.2 says, Therefore we will not fear, though the earth should change. Though the earth should change. Have you ever had experiences where it just feels like your whole world has changed? Well, when your world changes, when you lose a job, lose a friend, a family member, lose a home, lose a relationship. Whatever it is that changes your world, 
I want to ask you, do you worry when those things happen? You start getting worried. Do you fear? Do you get angry? Some people get angry with God when these things happen. God wants us to trust Him all the time. He wants us to trust Him even when changes happen to our world. As Christians, we are expected to change. I want you to think about this. If a person never changes, they rot. I mean... Bed sores are a problem for sick people who can't change their position in bed, right? You've got to change. You've got to change your position or you'll start to rot. Change isn't only inevitable in life. It's essential for a healthy life. In fact, we're going to learn that we can't please God unless... We change. Because if we never change, we never grow. We never mature. But that's not to say that change is easy. Change is difficult. Mark Twain, one of my favorite authors, once said, No one likes change but a wet baby. Change is never easy, but it is necessary. And you may have noticed sometimes, often, in the church, we try to make changes, and a lot of the changes don't last. We end up going back to traditional way of doing things. I've had many old-timers in church tell me, I've seen new trends come and go, but we always go back to our traditions. Well, it's unfortunate, but it is true. And the reason that change doesn't last, whether we're talking about in the church or in our own lives, is because we work on the exterior on our outside behavior, on what people see. We look at our list of rules and we say, if I just do this, this, and this, and I don't do this, this, and this, I'll be fine. What we should be doing is looking at our interior, our motives, our thoughts, and changing those things things. Any lasting change has to start on the inside. I've known way too many addicts who think that if they just stop the addiction, they just stop doing it, life will be better. Any of you that have been addicted, no. Unless you change inside, it's coming back. That addiction will take you over again. No matter how long you stop. I had a friend many years ago when I was a teenager in my church. An addict, drug addict. He stopped taking drugs for Uh, many years talked about it a lot it was his testimony except he still had the desire and all it took was one oral surgery and the oral surgeon giving him what he craved and he ended up Back into it again. You have to change what's inside. You have to allow God to change you inside. 
or the change is not going to last. So today I want us to study a story in the Bible about one of the old Bible characters from a few thousand years ago, Jacob. To see the process that God uses to change our world so we will become the people He wants us to be. Follow along with me. Genesis 32, verses 24 to 32. goes like this. But Jacob stayed behind by himself, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he couldn't get the best of Jacob as they wrestled, he deliberately threw Jacob's hip out of joint. The man said, let me go, it's daybreak. Jacob said, I'm not letting you go till you bless me. The man said, what's your name? He answered, Jacob. The man said, but no longer. Your name is no longer Jacob. From now on, it's Israel, which means God wrestler. You've wrestled with God, and you've come through. Jacob asked, and what's your name? The man said, why do you want to know my name? And then, right then and there, he blessed him. Jacob named the place Peniel which means God's face, because he said, I saw God face to face and lived to tell the story. And the sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. Interesting story. Jacob was forever changed because he had an encounter with God. And there's a process hidden here that we can learn from his encounter with God that will teach us how God encourages change in our lives, in our world. You know, the truth is, God loves us. God loves you just as you were. And He called you into His family even when your life was a mess. But what a lot of people forget is, even though God loves us how we are, He doesn't want us to stay that way. He wants us to change. It's all through the Bible that we are supposed to change. He expects us to become like Jesus. The Bible is very clear on that, which means we have to change. Because I have not yet met a person who is just like Jesus without changing. Have you? God will do everything He can, including let us, to, let us get hurt, like Ben was just talking about, to encourage change in our world, in our lives. So let's learn about how God promotes change in our world. If you're following along in the handouts that came in your bulletin or on our app, here's your first fill in the blank. God, uh, change happens through, number one, crisis. Crisis. Think about this. If you're anything like me, almost every change in your life begins with a crisis. Jacob's change in his life sure did. Let's read again what happened. We just read it a minute ago. Refresh your memory. Genesis 32, 24, and 25. But Jacob stayed behind by himself, and 
a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When he saw that he couldn't get the best of Jacob as they wrestled, he deliberately threw Jacob's hip out of joint. Instant pain. If you've ever had your hip out of joint, you know the pain I'm talking about. The pain that Jacob was going through. You also might recognize the strength of the angel he was wrestling. All he had to do was just touch his hip. Went out of socket. But have you ever noticed that people don't typically change until they are forced into it by some circumstance. We are so stubborn. It's often a crisis that makes us uncomfortable enough that we decide, hmm, maybe I need to do something different. Because this is sure uncomfortable. And the truth is, If nothing bad ever happens, we're usually content to just keep doing the same thing we've always done. I believe when God wants us to change, He often allows a crisis in our life because He's trying to get our attention. Usually some frustrating situation that is beyond our control. In fact, if if you're in one of those crises right now, I can assure you, it's because God is wanting change in your world. He wants you to change for the better. He wants to help you change. And if you'll just Trust Him. You'll be a better person for it. However, I need to warn you, you need to really trust Him. you got to do it for real. There's a lot of people that try to fake their way through. Well, like this guy. Take a look. Everyone has trials and tough times in their life, but it is when we remain strong in our faith during those times that people can tell how faithful we are. However, being faithful to God during trials takes a lot of faith and patience and prayer, which can be pretty hard. Here's an easier method that will make you seem faithful without all the work. Speak as though you've given control over to God. Say things like, it's in God's hands, and I'm just praying and asking Him to fix this but act as though God isn't going to help you and you'll have to fix all your problems yourself. Just go around doing what you think needs to be done. And if God fixes it for you, then problem solved. And if he doesn't, then you've got a backup plan. But either way, people will think you were faithful during your trials. This has been How to Succeed as a Christian Without Really Trying. You got to really try. You can't succeed. That won't. That wouldn't work. It doesn't work. I know people who act like that. I know people. In fact, it's funny when you're a pastor, you experience this a lot. I will be introduced to someone as Pastor Michael, and all of a sudden they're the most holy person. Everything they say is saintly and godly. It doesn't work. You have to actually change. Look at what the writer of Hebrews said. Hebrews 12, starting in verse 5. But you have forgotten what the scriptures say, that the, that the scriptures say to God's children. When the Lord punishes you, don't make light of it. And when he corrects you, don't be discouraged. The Lord corrects the people He loves and disciplines those He calls His own. Be patient when you are being corrected. This is how God treats His children. Don't all parents correct their children? God corrects all of His children. And if He doesn't correct you, 
then you don't really belong to Him. Our earthly fathers correct us, and we still respect them. Isn't it even better to be given true life by letting our spiritual father correct us? Our human fathers correct us for a short time, and they do it as they think best. But God corrects us for our own good because He wants us to be holy as He is. It is never fun to be corrected. It's one of those duh statements. In fact, at the time, it is always painful. But if we learn to obey by being corrected, we will do right and live at peace. Amen? In his book, God's Answers, Pastor Rick Warren wrote this, A mother eagle will take the nest of her young and stir it up. She will make them uncomfortable and miserable. Then kick them out and force them to learn to fly for their own good in life. God does that in our lives. He makes us uncomfortable, if that's what it takes, because He knows what is best and He wants us to grow. He will allow a crisis, problem, irritation, or frustration in our lives to get our attention. He needs to do this because we won't change until our fear of change is exceeded by the pain we are experiencing. Remember that the next time you're in the middle of a crisis. God uses hard times to get us to change. He hasn't abandoned you. I know it feels like that sometimes when you're going through a problem. Where is God? But in actuality, He's right there with you. Contrary to the feeling that He's abandoned you, He's closer to you than ever. He's working on your life to make you better. Give in to His control. In fact, let's make that a focus of our prayers this week, Monday and Tuesday. Ask God to help you change through your crisis. Okay? Everybody with me so far? Nobody walked out. That's a good sign. <laughs> Pastor teaching tough stuff again. Well, here's, here's point number two. Change happens through confession. Through confession. Remember in our story of Jacob, the angel that was wrestling with Jacob asked him his name. Let's read that again. Verse 27. The man said, what's your name? He answered, Jacob. That may not mean much to you, but do you know what Jacob means? It means deceiver. Can you imagine? Hey, how are you doing? What's your name? Me? I'm, I'm deceiver. That's what Jacob's name meant. Deceiver. And Jacob lived up to that name. <laughs> he deceived his father, his brother, his father-in-law. He was always in trouble his whole life and on the run. So it wasn't that the angel didn't know his name. That's not why he asked him. The angel wanted Jacob to confess who he was. He was a cheater, a schemer. And in having to say his own name, Jacob 
was confronted with who he really is. And when he identified himself as Jacob, he was admitting his character flaws, his sins. I am a deceiver. That's who I am. Proverbs 28, 13 tells us the importance of confession. It says, if you don't confess your sins, you will be a failure. Who wants to be a failure? But God will be merciful if you confess your sins and give them up. Realizing who you really are and admitting it is a big part of God's plan to get you to realize you need to change. You're not okay as you are. Yes, God loves you as you are. Yes, God called you as you are, but He's trying to change you. And as we already saw, God will often send crises that will help us to realize, I can't do this as I am. I can't survive as I am. I can't go through life like this. I need help. I need to change. I need God. Once we understand who we are and we Realize what our sins are. We must confess them. 1 John 1.9 tells us, If we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, He is faithful and just true to His own nature and promises, and will forgive our sins, dismiss our lawlessness, and continuously cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Everything not in conformity to His will in purpose, thought, and action. We must confess. When you hear the word confession, most people think of the Catholic Church. You got to go to confession. You got to climb in that booth, talk to a priest behind the screen. But confession isn't just for Catholics. In fact, admitting your sins is the only way you will ever allow God to change you into what He's called you to be. Confession, not only to God, but to mature Christians who can help guide you, who can hold you accountable, is necessary for repairing your life and receiving healing from God. Look what James tells us in James 5.16. Confess your sins to each other. And pray for each other so God can heal you. You want to be healed? You've got to confess. You've got to get rid of the sin that's there. Confess who you really are and what you're doing. To somebody who can help you, who can pray for you, When a believing person prays, great things happen. Don't hide your sin. Don't pretend like everything's okay. Don't try to handle it all yourself. Reverend Joseph Benson, he was a pastor that lived back in the 1800s, said this. He said, we may confess them, our sins, to any pious person who can pray in faith. And He will then know how to pray for us and will be more excited so to do. And pray for one another that ye may be healed both in soul and body. 
We all need healing, my friends. We all have parts of our lives that have been destroyed by sin. And our confession needs to happen with other Christians because we need their help in changing. We need them to help us be accountable. In many ways, confession to God is easy compared with confessing to a person. You can confess to God and nobody knows what you're confessing. The problem is, much of the time when you've confessed to God, you have no one that will hold you accountable. Because the truth is, if you were listening to the Holy Spirit all along, you would never have done those sins. It's too easy when we're in our own mind, when we're in our own heads, and nobody else knows to fall back into those sins. And when we are sinning, It's a disease that is eating away at our life. Physically, spiritually, emotionally. When we confess our sins to a wise, mature Christian, I realize that there are some people you would not want to confess your sins to. I get it. You need to be wise in who you talk with. It should be a mature Christian who will help hold you accountable, not go and tell somebody else. Right? Don't confess to a gossip. Bad idea. But it's another reason why it's so important to be faithful to a local church where we know each other, we love each other, we hold each other up. It's another reason that God created the church the way He did and instructs us to be involved the way He does. It's an important part of God's plan because you're not going to change until you admit your sin. Don't make excuses. Don't blame other people for what you're doing. Simply say, I'm in a mess. I have a problem. And I admit it. I've sinned. Then, God can go to work on changing your life. So I'm going to give you a, a real challenge this week. Wednesday and Thursday. Talk to God. Ask Him who you should talk with, who you should trust, and then confess your sins to a mature Christian that you know, that you love, that loves you, and will help you stay on that right path. That's a challenge. See, God wants to change your world. He wants you to have these world changes that we're talking about this morning. And change happens through crisis and confession. Let's get to our last point for today. Change happens through, number three, cooperation. Cooperation. See, God began changing Jacob as soon as he confessed and began to cooperate with God and with God's will. In fact, God commemorated the occasion of Jacob's change this way, if you remember. Look at this verse with me again, Genesis thirty-two twenty-eight. 28. The man said, but no longer, your name is no longer Jacob, for from now on, it's Israel, God wrestler. You've wrestled with God And you've come through. 
See, when Jacob began to cooperate, that's when God started changing him. First, by giving him a new name, a new identity. I mean, after a personal encounter with God, you're no longer the same person. You come away changed when you encounter God. God changed Jacob from a deceiver to a mighty warrior. God knew Jacob's potential. He knew Jacob was destined for greater things. He just needed Jacob to cooperate. And it's the same thing he asks of us. The same is true for you and me. As I often say, God is the perfect gentleman. He will never force you to do anything. He waits patiently for you to cooperate with Him and with His will for your life. Sometimes prompting you through a crisis to get your attention, to get you to realize you need to change. And the thing is, if you really, truly love Him, you will change when He does these things. You will obey. In John 14, 15, Jesus said to His disciples, If you love Me, you will do as I command. The thing we often forget is that when we accept God's free gift of eternal life, we promise Him control of our lives. I know a whole lot of people right here in our neighborhood that call themselves Christians, but they don't prove they love God. They don't show their love of Christ by obedience. So are they Christians? When we refuse to cooperate with God, when we aren't following the Holy Spirit's leading, when we aren't obeying God's Word, when we aren't changing, we aren't growing, and God won't be able to use us to our full potential if we will not cooperate. Mark 16, 20. Look closely at this verse. Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed His word by the signs that accompanied it. Notice, the Lord worked with them. How does God do His work here in the world? Through us. Through His people. It's the reason we exist. It's the reason that when we accept God's free gift of eternal life, He doesn't immediately take us to heaven. Because we have work to do here for God, for God's kingdom. We need to be obeying His will. We have work to do. We can't fulfill God's will if we're not cooperating with Him. And He can't work in our lives unless we allow Him control and live his way, not our way. I mean, that's what we've been talking about all year when we say, don't let the news persuade you, just trust God. Trusting God means cooperating with Him. Allowing Him to do whatever He wants to do through you. That's what it means to trust God. 
And did you see here in this scripture, the Lord worked with him and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. You know, the Bible talks a lot about the signs, about the power that we have, the spiritual gifts, the supernatural abilities as Christians we possess because we have God's Holy Spirit who raised Christ from the dead living in us. Jesus himself said, you will do greater things than I have done. So do you ever wonder why you can't? You ever want to be able to do those things that the Bible says you can do and wonder why it's not happening in your life? Well, I'm here to tell you today, it takes complete cooperation, complete submission to God. That's the only way God can work in you and through you. It's the only way you will ever have those signs. Because it's the only way the Lord can work with you is if you cooperate. See, change happens when we cooperate. Let's make this a focus of prayer this week. Friday and Saturday, ask God to help you cooperate fully with him. Will you do that? I've given you a lot of things to talk to think about this morning. And as the worship team comes up, we're going to end this service with some more worship, but I want to remind you that the stuff that we talk about here at Abundant Life on Sunday mornings is meant to be a challenge. It's it's done this way on purpose. We don't spend a whole lot of time in evangelism. That is, telling people who Jesus is and what He did so that they will accept Him into their lives, so that they will come into God's kingdom. You know why? Because that's our job as Christians to do outside of these walls. When you read through the New Testament, you will not find anywhere that it says the church is a place for people to come and learn about Jesus and accept Him as their Savior. What the Bible does say is we are to go out into the world and introduce them to Jesus. Church is a place where you bring those people to learn how to live after they're a Christian. Now that's not to say it's a bad thing to evangelize in church, but we don't spend a whole lot of time focused on that here because what we do is try to mature people who are already Christians. And so these these messages on Sunday mornings are meant to challenge you. They're meant to make you grow spiritually. And today's message is a really good representation of what it takes to be a mature Christian. In order to trust God, we must change. Do you agree? So if you find yourself in a crisis today, which many of us are, in fact, most Christians spend much of their life in a crisis. And maybe this morning you have realized through this message that God might be trying to get you to change something in your life. Let me be the first to tell you it is worth it. It's worth the trial you're going through. It's worth the hardship and the pain. Let God work. Allow this crisis to lead you to confession 
and repentance to change your life, change your world, and then make a commitment to cooperate fully with God and His will for your life, even if it's scary. A lot of times, the things God asks us to do are scary. But the only way you will ever be fulfilled in life is if you allow God to change you to what He wants you to be. Allow Him to lead you where He wants you to go. Cooperate with Him fully. I mean, let's face it, the world changes. That's not a bad thing. It's bad when we don't change. Let God change your world. You won't regret it. I promise. Let's go through these things that we talked about here today. Let God change your world. If you're in a crisis, start with confession. Confess those things you know that you're doing wrong. Make a commitment to cooperate with God and make a promise to Him today.